and share your screen and I will. Ah, hey, thanks. Okay. Great. Let me share my screen here. Okay, you should be able to see my screen. Does that, that work? Looks good. Okay, well, very good. So I'm just going to start where we left off last time and we'll see how far we get to, for the first lecture and whatever is left we'll do for the second lecture after a half an hour break. So welcome everybody. I enjoyed talking to uh, quite a few people during the recitation section last night. I think that worked out nicely. And uh, if you missed it, uh, it, it was lots of fun. Uh, we have really good people from CTEC and MCNET who are in each of these little virtual rooms uh, to kind of facilitate a discussion. So it looked like it was uh, fun for everybody. So what I want to do is talk about uh, partons and renormalization. We had previously talked about deeply elastic scattering. So there was a picture of deeply elastic scattering. And there's a formula for the hard scattering cross-section in terms of parton distribution functions. So what I want to talk about now is um, what's called the factorization scale. That's a different scale that gets into your problem. And then how are part-time distribution functions defined and the evolution of them. They depend on this factorization scale. So what happens when you change the factorization scale and then fitting those to data. So we argued uh, in the classical parton model, which came before the development of QCD, that the space-time separation between interactions of partons within a proton, if I take the plus component of those, which is conjugate to the minus component of momentum, and the uh, proton's going fast in the plus direction, so everything in the plus direction is Lorentz dilated, then the delta x plus is the big Q of your process, so the Z boson, well, our process was deep in elastic scattering, uh, Q over M squared, X M squared, actually, X pure cane. And so Q is enormous. So that's much bigger than the scale one over Q at which you're measuring the part time. Therefore, when you're doing the measurement, you can think of the parton interactions as just being stopped. The partons are frozen. That was the classical picture. But now have a look at the graph that I've got on the screen there. That's a picture of parton coming in and there's a momentum Q being exchanged by a, say a Z boson. But before that happens, a gluon is emitted with momentum K. So now just think about how that works. We have to integrate over K. And integration over K maps to an integration over delta X plus, that's the delta X plus between when it was emitted and when the parton was measured, when the gluon was emitted and when, when the quark was measured. We integrated over delta X plus, well, we said delta X plus is going to be big. So as big as Q over XM squared. But if you just look at that diagram, you square this diagram and then see how it behaves, uh, delta X plus can be small. That is, this propagator here can be far off shell, as far off shell as Q. So delta X plus isn't really Q over XM squared. It's integrated down to one over Q. So something's wrong with that naive parton model. And we have to fix that up. So what we're going to do is just divide up the integration region. If I think of it in position space, then think of log of delta x plus. And if that's big, then we're really talking about the gluon, uh, the quark, including the gluon interaction being part of the part-time distribution function. So here in blue for big delta X plus 
every emission is counted as the essentially the wave function of the proton squared. That's part of the parton distribution function. But, <clears throat> but on the other hand, if delta X plus is small, so that quark propagator there is very far off shell, then that's a perturbative calculation. It's a hard process. And you should in fully incorporate it in your perturbative calculation. So now inside of that integral, you have to put a cut between well, the large delta X plus region and the small delta X plus region. And you put that at delta X plus is one over mu F. So there's a perturbative calculation and then part of the part time distribution functions. And this delta F is called the factorization scale. So you'll see that uh, in lots of uh, papers that discuss how to apply all of this to real processes. So evidently then your parton distribution function has to depend on this mu f. And the cross section shouldn't depend on mu f because the cross section is something in nature. It doesn't know about how you calculate things. So the partonic cross section, which we call here sigma hat for a scattering, deeply elastic scattering off of a parton of flavor A, that has to depend on mu f too. And I'll talk about it a little more later, but you, this formula has corrections of order one GV, that's M over Q. Okay, so both the part-time distribution function and the part-time scattering cross-section have to depend on mu f. The scattering cross-section also depends on mu, that was the renormalization scale. But the, <clears throat> if inside of that, when you expand it in perturbation theory, there's alpha strong and it's alpha strong of mu. And at higher orders of perturbation theory, the dependence on those scales should be smaller and smaller. This applies to hadron-hadron collisions as well as deeply elastic scattering. So it's just because the total has to be independent of mu f that the dependence needs to be smaller and smaller as you get to higher and higher orders because the rate of change of the cross section with respect to mu f should be order alpha strong to the n plus one if you've calculated it order alpha strong in the n. So I'm just gonna show you an example of that just to show you that it works. Uh, instead of doing Z production, or instead of doing deeply elastic scattering, I want to do one jet inclusive cross section, d sigma to et and y. Uh, y is the jet rapidity, et is the jet transverse momentum. It's usually called the transverse energy, which is always means the absolute value of transverse momentum. So we'll come back to jets later on, but I think you understand that there are jets and we could measure a cross section to make one jet plus anything else. So uh, it's fairly simple to do the calculation of the cross section for PP bar collisions. In this case, it's for a square root of S equals 1800 GV, 1.8 TV. Let's just see what that looks like. So I've just made a plot of the cross section. So that's d sigma d et and y that depends on mu and mu f. Uh, the cross section divided by the cross section at some standard point, which I just took to be both scales equals ET divided by two, just to standardize it. And I'm plotting it versus log of the scales. So to write log of the scales, I say that mu is ET over two times two to some number, and then I plot versus the number. So N U UV or NCO, are logarithms of respectively mu or mu f. Uh, mu, the uv refers to ultraviolet divergences and the co of course is uh, collinear divergences because that's what ref is reflected in these dependence on those scales. So what do you see here? Right in the middle by definition, um, the cross section 
ratio there is one, 1 1.00, but it changes as you go to larger uh, mu or larger mu f. Larger mu f is going up in this diagram, larger mu is going to the right. And well, if you go here, these are contour lines of constant cross-section ratio and it goes down to say 0 0.9 if you go quite a ways. Uh, or if you go the other direction, it goes up to 1.05. And the left-hand graph was for ET is 100 GV. And if you take ET is 500 GV, uh, actually it looks just about the same. They're a little bit different graphs, but they're not too different. So what you see is a dependence on those scales, but it's a kind of a mild dependence because we're using next to leading order perturbation theory here. So we expect not too much dependence. And were I to do this at next to next to leading order, which is now possible, uh, we'd have a similar looking graph, but it would be smoother. And the shape would be a little different. This is a quadratic shape. Uh, you see a, a saddle point in the middle and going up on one side and going down on another. That's a matrix times uh, NUV squared plus NUV times NCO plus NCO squared, some kind of matrix like that. So a quadratic function, it'd be a cubic function if you looked at uh, one more order of perturbation theory, but you know, the idea is the same. And you can use this sort of picture to try and estimate the uh, expected error from the theory from leaving out higher orders uh, in the same way we did it when there was one scale and we looked at electron positron annihilation with one scale as a function of the scale. Okay, so that's about what the scale means or how it's used anyway. Let me now talk about what a part-time distribution function is. Uh, you need a definition of it if you're going to make sense of everything. You can't just say it goes into a formula and that's it. So the definition is in quantum field theory with QCD as the interaction. They are the matrix elements in a proton of a certain operator. And I've written it out here and I should just spend a little time to uh, explain this. So I start with a proton state. I haven't written the spin of the proton, but if I did write it, there would be an S, P, S for the spin, and then I should sum over S. So P, S on the right, and then in a bra state, P, S on the left summed over S. And it's the same momentum. So it's just in that proton state, what is this operator that I wrote in the middle? What's the expectation value of that operator? And what is the operator? Psi I here, is quark field operator. So I'm writing the distri part-time distribution function for finding a quark as a quark of kind I, say an up quark. And I'm measuring that operator position equals zero. And it's a direct spinner and there's a direct matrix gamma plus. And then over here, there's the same kind of operator. This is destroying a quark, a psi bar operator. And it destroys it at x plus equals zero, transverse position equals zero, but y minus, position y minus component. And I've integrated over y minus with exponential of i c plus y minus. So you see that's a Fourier transform. And that is causing me to destroy uh, a quark with a certain plus momentum, namely, if the plus momentum of the quark I'm destroying is C times the plus momentum of the proton. And the fact that the transverse momentum, the transverse position is zero in each case means I'm integrating over transverse momentum. Okay, and then there's F. Yeah, I wrote it in red here. F is a certain operator and that's an important part of the distribution. So F is, exponential, the P means path order. So I expand this exponential and order the non-commuting operators in order of Z minus. Exponential of I times the coupling times integral DZ minus. And Z minus goes from zero to Y minus. So 
C minus starts at zero here in the, where I destroy a quark. And then uh, up to Y minus where Y minus is where I recreate the quark. And I've got a field operator, A plus, that's the gluon field operator at that C minus. And it's times a color matrix TA. That's a, this is SU3 color. So there's matrices around and those are the generator matrices of SU3. So that's an operator, A. That's the gluon operator. And that can absorb or create gluons uh, between one place and the other. And the importance of that is, from a technical point of view, it makes this operator gauge invariant. If I change the gauge of A, it changes psi, it changes psi bar, it changes that A plus in the middle, and the net change from a change of gauge is zero. Alternatively, I can choose the gauge A plus equals zero, which is a kind of convenient gauge for thinking about partons. And if A plus is zero, then this F is the unit operator. So and that's nice and intuitive that I just, it's a probability to destroy a quark and recreate the quark. Uh, and what's the other thing? For gluons, there's a similar definition, but it's gluon fields operators all over the place. And when I do Feynman diagrams to evaluate in perturbation theory, what is this F? I won't be reliable perturbation theory, but I can still do it with wave functions for the P's, beta cell Peter wave functions. Then I'm going to get ultraviolet divergences, basically because I uh, destroy a quark at transverse position zero and recreate it at transverse position zero. There's an integral over transverse momentum. And doing that integral leads to a logarithmic divergence. So I have to do something about that. And well, ultraviolet divergence is you get rid of by renormalization. So we renormalize this operator uh, by subtracting ultraviolet poles. That's the so-called MS bar prescription. You could renormalize it a different way, but MS bar is uh, incredibly convenient. So that's what everybody uses. And the when you do renormalization with MS bar prescription, you need a scale, that scale is mu f. So that tells you how mu f gets into the definition of the parton distribution functions. Okay, so that's the definition. Let me show you a picture. On the left-hand picture is one that's what we've had. I'm showing a proton with large momentum in the plus direction and all the quarks and gluons inside of it interacting with each other, but slowly usually. And in comes a Z boson that is going to measure a quark. Well, what does that do? It means it scatters the quark. So you can see a little quark line there. And it got scattered and scattered off going in the minus direction instead of the plus direction. But it's still going. It's, it's there. It's just zooming out of the proton. And eventually it'll make a jet going in the other direction. Uh, and as it's going out, it could well absorb a gluon that was inside of the proton. So I drew a gluon getting absorbed. So now let me look at the definition of the quark distribution function, where I destroy a quark at position zero and then I've multiplied it by recreating the quark at position y minus. So let me just talk about the amplitude. This is what I've written here is a square. It's an amplitude times a conjugate amplitude. That's an amplitude p times an operator and a conjugate amplitude bra p times another operator. So just the amplitude instead of the square is got this picture on the right where I destroyed a quark at the origin. So that's the origin of my coordinate system. And this red line is something that's going in the minus direction and it can uh, destroy or absorb or create uh, gluons. That's the operator F. Remember that's a line integral going in the minus direction of the gluon field. My line integral 
and I should remind you, goes from zero to one minus, but for purposes of talking about amplitudes, it goes from zero to infinity, and then in the, in the complex conjugate amplitude, it goes from infinity to one minus. So think of zero to infinity in the amplitude. Okay, so the right-hand picture is a picture of the definition of a part-time distribution function. The left-hand side is a picture of deeply elastic scattering. And what you can see is that there's a great similarity between those two pictures. That similarity is the reason that F2 uh, for deeply elastic scattering, the structure function that you can measure is at lowest order a quark distribution function because, well, the same thing happens. Uh, either a quark, a real physical quark goes out or this iconal approximate quark goes out. But in either case, it's, it's very similar. Uh, deeply elastic scattering cross-section and the quark distribution function will differ at higher orders, but at lowest order, they're the same. Okay. Uh, there's another feature of my part-time distribution functions. They have some roles because I've defined them in terms of field operators and field operators uh, evolve according to QCD, which has the symmetries of QCD, namely flavor conservation, energy conservation. So there are some roles here. Integral dx of the distribution of up quarks in a proton as a function of x for any fixed scale, minus the distribution of anti-up quarks. That's up quarks minus anti-up quarks. That's the net up quark number in a proton integrated over x is two because there's net two up quarks in a proton. There could be two up quarks plus a bunch of up anti-up pairs but if I subtract the anti-ups, I should get exactly two. So that's a, what's called a flavor sum rule. And also what's the total momentum of everything in a proton? So I sum over all the kinds of hadrons, uh, sorry, not hadrons, quarks and gluons, multiply by X and integrate over X, that should be the total momentum fraction of everything in the proton. And that should be one. It's because we're talking about momentum fraction, the momentum of quark or gluon divided by the momentum of the proton. Okay. Now let's go back to the calculating deeply elastic scattering. Let's just recall that we renormalize the part-time distributions with the MS bar prescription at scale mu f. So that means in this calculation that I've outlined here where I emitted a gluon, not exactly because MS bar is subtracting poles, not putting a cut in, but roughly speaking, the transverse momentum of that gluon if it's small, then the gluon belongs to the quark distribution function. Whereas if the gluon is too large, then I've renormalized it away. I've not counted the gluon as part of the um, proton. So I've not counted that emission as part of the proton, proton distribution function. So you just integrate this graph here over k up to a limit k squared t, kt squared is mu f squared. And that's how the part-time distribution function gets to depend on mu f. So now we can say, how does the part-time distribution function depend on mu f? If I differentiate with respect to the logarithm of mu f, the part-time distribution function, I can just look at all the possible graphs and what I'm gonna get from each graph is the derivative of the part-time distribution function equals the part-time distribution function uh, with a momentum fraction C that is bigger than X. Here's X is where I'm measuring and C is something bigger. 
uh, times some function, which is a function of x over c. And alpha strong, alpha strong of mu f, by the way. And this p uh, has a perturbative expansion. So it's p1 times alpha s over pi, or alpha s over 2 pi, if you like. And p2 times alpha s squared over pi. And you can figure out what those things are. So this evolution equation for part-time distribution functions called the, it was originally called the alter L decrease equation, uh, at least in the United States and Europe. Uh, but it is quickly changed because a lot of the credit belongs to other people besides Alterelli and Parisi. So it's the DGLAP, Doxitzer, Griboff, Lipitoff, Alterelli, and Parisi equation. And it has a kernels, which I'm not going to write out, but you can easily look them up in any textbook, what these P1 is and the P2 is rather more complicated. And uh, you can either do P3. And so you have an evolution equation that tells you just precisely how the part-time distribution functions change when uh, I change the mu f. And there's a good way to think about that. I wrote up at the top of this slide the equation. So now imagine that you solve that equation, uh, give an alpha s of some mu one, and then you want to know what is alpha s at a smaller scale mu two if I run the equation backwards. That's the most easy way to think about it. So uh, that says alpha s of one scale equals alpha s of the other scale plus p, let's say first order p, uh, integrated over alpha s, integrated over c, momentum fraction, and integrated over the scale between the two scales you're talking about. Right, I just put the d log of mu f on the right-hand side and integrated. So that's a first order change in the part-time distribution function because of evolution. And I can iterate that. I can say, what's the change at second order? So there's now integration over two scales, uh, mu and mu prime, that both run between the mu one and mu two uh, times the alter early, times the part and distribution function at the smaller scale. So I just drew a picture of that. If I iterated it uh, twice, actually. So here I'm measuring a gluon inside a proton. That's what this dot's supposed to mean. I measure that gluon. But that gluon could have come from a gluon uh, in a part-time distribution function at a smaller scale. So here's a gluon at the smaller scale and it's split into two gluons. So, so the P glue glue is part of this P. So my smaller scale gluon split to two higher scale ones with a momentum transfer that runs between the lower scale, uh, between the highest scale and the lower scale. But that gluon that I just thought of as part of the proton could itself have come from splitting of a uh, lower scale proton, a, a lower scale gluon, by the blue one split into two green ones. And the blue one could have come from a splitting of something at yet a lower scale. So what you have is kind of a microscope when you measure the uh, part-time distribution function. So when you do an experiment that is affected by part-time distribution functions. If you have a really high scale, you can measure at a high scale, but that's, that's because you have a great microscope which sees at small distances. And what it sees uh, is because of the splitting of something that's a little fuzzier, has uh, less momentum transfer in its limit, or it's just fuzzy in the transverse position. So, I use a microscope, a very powerful microscope, and then here would be using a less powerful, and here's a less powerful. So here in the original, that's a part-time distribution function at a very low scale, where I don't say exactly, so exactly what the distribution is. Uh, these are fuzzy gluons, the black one. The blue ones are less fuzzy, and the green ones are even less fuzzy. So it's uh, partons and a partons and a parton. That's what's the 
evolution equation says. So I've talked about how things evolve. Let's now look at a cross section. So there's a part time distribution function as a function of mu, and I could have written this two scales for deep and elastic scattering, and then a sigma hat. And that's a part time deep and elastic scattering from a part time. And for hadron, hadron collisions, I've just got a similar formula, but there's two parton distribution functions because there's two hadrons. So these parton distribution functions, you can't really calculate. Uh, well, sort of you can. You can calculate them in lattice gauge theory, but the calculation uh, is not very accurate. You can just get them very roughly. However, if you have lots of experiments, then you can fit what those Spartan distribution functions are. So the idea is I measure this one on the left, the green one, and I can calculate the sigma hats, and that tells me what the um, Spartan distribution functions are. So there's a big enterprise to fit these things because we really, really need to know Spartan distribution functions. And the way to do that is, what you want to fit is part time distribution functions at a starting scale mu naught, a low scale, say one GV or one and a half GV. Once you know part time distribution function at mu naught, uh, then you can use the evolution equation to find the part time distribution function at any higher scale. And once you have them at the higher scale, then you can make a prediction for some measurable cross-section uh, using the sigma hat that you've calculated. And the F is then part and distribution function evolved from mu naught up to mu. That should be an observed cross-section. So you use data to say whether you agree with data or not. And probably you don't agree with data, but then you go back and you adjust, adjust F of X and mu naught and you keep adjusting it until you get every possible observed cross-section just right. Or, well, it's never just right, but as right as you can get it. So in fact, people fit lots and lots of data. Uh, the part-time distribution functions that mu not have uh, roughly 30 parameters in them. And you have roughly 3,000 data from various experiments. So there's lots of data and not too many parameters to fit. So there's now a big program to uh, fit these things. And since you fit 3000 data more or less with 30 parameters, uh, there's not so much freedom. It doesn't have to work, but it does work and you get good fits. Uh, and that tells you that the theory you're using is in fact right. Okay, so Let's just review about part-time distribution functions. They have a definition that's independent of any particular process. It's just in terms of field operators. They obey a simple evolution equation that describes the effect of changing the part-time resolution. And they appear in any short distance process with one or two hadrons in the initial state. And then finally, uh, you fit those to experimental results. Okay, so now let's talk about hadron hadron collisions. We had talked about deeply elastic scattering, but let's, let's go to hadron hadron collisions. So now we have there's an initial state with two hadrons, then there's a hard scattering, and then there's a final state. And I want to talk about a couple of topics rapidity, then the Drillian process, and uh, new particle production, and then jets. So rapidity is just one of the things that everybody's supposed to know about. So let's just learn about it. Uh, it's usually called Y, or sometimes eta, and it's useful for hadron hadron collisions. It's just a kinematic thing. So let's think of the center mass frame with the Z axis along the beam direction. 
And let's consider the production of a massive particle like a Z boson. So the momentum of the Z boson is Q, and I'll write that as Q plus, Q minus, Q transverse using light uh, null plane coordinates. Then Y is just defined to be a half the logarithm of Q plus over Q minus. Or if you want to write the components of Q, then it's got a transverse momentum QT, and its plus momentum down here is e to the y times the square root of qt squared plus m squared over two, and e to the minus y times that same square root. So you might try to now find q squared. That's the plus times the minus times two. That'd be qt squared plus m squared because the y's cancel. And then minus qt squared, it just leads to the m squared. So that's q squared equals m squared. Okay, so it's very convenient to use rapidity as a variable. And why is that? Under a boost in the z direction, q plus changes to e to the omega times the old q plus. And q minus changes to e to the minus omega times the old q minus. And q transverse is not changed. So why, if q plus gets to be multiplied by e to the omega and q minus e to the minus omega, then I have log of e to the two omega, that's uh, y, that's omega. So y changes to y plus omega. So it's just got an incredibly simple property under boost in the z direction. And you really want to have that property because uh, physics is, you have to be able to look at physics with different amounts of boost in the z direction. You can start in the LHC of looking at two protons in their center mass frame. So here I do two protons and those little things inside are quarks and gluons. But when the quark and a gluon collide, maybe the blue quark has more momentum than the green gluon. So the uh, center of mass frame of the process, the whole process is not the center of mass frame of the quark gluon collision. And in order to get to the quark gluon collision, I should make a boost in the z direction. Also, if the particle is massless, you know, so I started with a massive z boson, but what if I go to a pion or something, it's almost massless, then why log of Q plus over Q minus times a half, you just work it out and it's minus the logarithm of the tangent of half the angle at which the particle's going out at, the I call theta here. So in that case, it's just a, a measure of the angle. And when you look, say, at one of those uh, Lego plot like I showed you with jets, that was uh, plotted versus pseudo rapidity eta, which is angle in the detector, log 10 theta over two. And if the particle is almost massless, but not quite massless, then negative of log 10 theta over two is called the pseudo rapidity, but it's almost equal to the rapidity. Okay, so let's talk about uh, production of virtual photons, Zs, Ws. Uh, consider d sigma dy, so y is the rapidity of a Z boson. I make proton plus proton A and B goes to Z plus anything, X is standing for anything. And the factored form of that cross section is Parton distribution function for hadron A as a function of some CA, and parton distribution function for hadron B as a function of CB. A and little a and little b stand for flavors, up, down, anti up, gluon, and I sum over those. And I've got a d sigma hat, that's the cross section for that kind of scattering, plus corrections of order. 1 GV divided by the mass of the Z boson. And the lower limit on CA is XA, which is e to the Y times square root of M squared over S, S being the 2PA dot PB. 
Okay, that's the factored form for the cross section. That's what you use to calculate d sigma dy. And let's just look at that formula. It has power suppressed corrections, which we should not forget about. So there's this formula, which you can expand to any order you like in perturbation theory. But the, the Fs are non perturbative, but the sigma hats uh, have order alpha s to the power zero for z production, and then order alpha s to the power one, order alpha s to the power two. That's calculated in perturbation theory. But no matter how many orders of perturbation theory you calculate, there's always this correction of order one GV over M, power suppressed corrections. And those, uh, if you're talking about one GV divided by 100 GV, it's not too important, particularly since the power is really M squared over big M squared, so it's even less important usually. Uh, but it's always there. And if you talk about uh, processes with a high scale that's not so big, those power suppressed corrections are more and more important. And as I just said, d sigma hat dy is evaluated at order alpha s to whatever power you can calculate. And then there's corrections. If you've calculated it up to order n, there's corrections of order n plus one. And I've written d sigma dy, why is the rapidity of a z boson? A z boson has some transverse momentum. So this graph here gives it a transverse momentum. And I've integrated over QT to make the cross section I want to measure. The z boson usually has QT squared much less than m squared and um, going kind of up to m squared. So I want to talk about that formula for just a little bit. Uh, it's not obvious that you can take the physical cross section d sigma dy and write it as something you can calculate times parton distribution functions. So to just demonstrate that it's not obvious, here I drew a picture for the z boson production and the z boson decays to mu plus mu minus. And uh, suppose, forget about those gluons for a moment, supposing that's a red quark. And suppose that's an anti-red anti-quark there. So red plus anti-red makes colorless, the so z boson is colorless. So that, that works for a cross section. But supposing I exchange a very, very soft gluon not with, with almost zero longitudinal momentum and small amount of transverse momentum. And between a spectator quark and the anti-quark that was coming in here from the other proton. So that can happen over a long distance, even before the proton and the anti-proton meet. And I glue on what was this? This was supposed to be an anti-red, anti-quark. It could have been before, uh, it could have been anti-red here, and then I took an anti-red blue, anti-blue gluon and made an anti-blue quark. And I could have done it the other way around too, from the uh, spectator quark over here to the active quark from hadron A. So I can easily, with a very, very soft interaction, change the colors of the quark and the anti-quark. And if I change them just the right way, they can still annihilate to make a Z boson. But if I change them in the wrong way, they won't make a Z boson. So it seems from that argument uh, that this formula here can't possibly be right. But it is right. And in order to show that it's right to some degree of uh, mathematical rigor, but not, not a very high degree, you need a lot of the properties of the theory. So the theory needs to be unitary. That is to say, the evolution U of T1, T2, the quantum evolution operator is a unitary operator. Uh, the theory needs to be causal. That is to say, field operators commute with each other if the positions of those field operators are space-like separated. And you need for the theory to be gauge invariant. So 
you know, you can change a mu to a mu plus d mu times some other operator. That's a change of gauge. And the whole theory is supposed to be invariant under a change of gauge. Uh, and the theory isn't invariant under a change of gauge. You need all of those properties to show that ugly things like this don't happen. Okay. Heavy particle production is another kind of process. We were talking about Z boson production, but what if I want to make uh, top quarks? So this line could represent a top and an anti top. Then I can have a gluon interacts with the top quark and another gluon interacts. So I can exchange the top quark between those two interaction points and make a top and an anti top. Or uh, my words here say if they're not top and anti quark, they're a squark and an anti squark. So those are imaginary particles, which one used to think were maybe real, but they're becoming more and more imaginary. Uh, the large scale in this process is the mass of that heavy thing, call it M. And in the case that M is big, this propagator right here has got to be off shell by at least scale m squared. So the k squared of that propagator is it's negative. It's less than or equal to minus m squared. So that's telling you this space-time separation between those two points is very small. This is a really hard process, and that allows you to use perturbation theory to calculate this cross-section. And that property is quite important because we're always looking for very heavy things at the uh, LHC. And we learned from this discussion that production of heavy things is a short distance process and it's susceptible to this same uh, factorized formula. Finally, there's uh, jet production. And that to make say two jets, we have to define what jets are, but that can make gluon, gluon goes to quark, anti-quark, and those quark and anti-quarks have hundreds of GeV of transverse momentum. So they're going to turn into jets. And here I drew one of them emitting a gluon, so that's starting to make a more complicated jet. So the cross-section for let's say one jet plus anything else, one jet with transverse momentum PT and rapidity Y is going to have the same kind of formula. Parton distribution for hadron A, parton distribution function for hadron B, and something you calculate in a fairly difficult calculation. Uh, let's see what time it is. Uh, yeah, let me let me just go on and do this. So what what would we mean by a jet? It's a spray of hadrons. Uh, so here's a picture of the result of a proton proton collision. And there's always remnants of the one beam and remnants of the other beam going out with small transverse momentum. But then I drew two sprays of particles uh, going out. And those are jets. And you need a definition of what a jet's going to be in order to uh, be able to calculate or measure a jet cross section. So one traditional definition of jets involves cones. You just try to surround all the particles in this jet with a cone in momentum space like that. Uh, and everything inside the cone is part of the jet and you just add up the momentum. But there's other forms of a jet definition that operate with successive combination of hadrons. So I was just going to tell you about one of those, the KT jet definition. You start with a list of protojets. So each hadron in your event, so all these lines, there's hundreds of lines here in a real event, uh, could be a protojet. 
or if you're doing a parton calculation, each parton coming out to whatever order of perturbation theory you're doing is a protojet. And you want to apply an algorithm and end up with a list of jets. So most of the quote jets have really low PT and you don't worry about them. You're interested in the high PT jets. And this definition has a parameter R that is similar to the cone size in the cone definition, the radius of the cone. So here's the algorithm. Uh, it's got several parts, five parts. For each pair of protojets, i, j, you define a distance between them, which is y, i minus y, j, those are the rapidities of the jets, squared, plus phi, i minus phi, j, those are the azimuthal angles of the jets, squared. So that's the angular separation squared between the uh, protojets times the minimum of the PT of the I jet or the PT of the J protojet and divided by R squared. So that's the distance Dij between two protojets. And also there's uh, a Di that only depends on protojet I, it's just the PD squared. You might regard that as the distance to the beam. So what you do, is you have this list of protojets and you find the smallest of all the dijs and the dis, call that d min. And if d min is one of the dijs, then you just merge protojets i and j into a new protojet k with uh, k as the sum of the momenta of i and j. And if it's a di, then you say the protojet i is not mergeable. There's nothing around it to merge with and you remove it from the list of protojets and add it to the list of jets. So either way, I've reduced the number of protojets by one on each step. And I just keep running that. So if there are any protojets remaining, you just go back to step one and you do the same thing. That's actually quite a simple algorithm. Uh, it's you know written with five steps. The Cohen algorithm seems to be simpler, but it's not because if there's two cones that overlap, uh, you don't know what to do with it and you need a lot of explanation of what to do. And let's just see. Let me just show an example here and then we'll, we'll quit. Um, the Dij was angle squared, times the minimum of pi squared and pj squared over r squared and di is pti squared. So let's just suppose there isn't any azimuthal angle and we have five protojets here. And the size of r is that big. So what is my algorithm gonna do? It's gonna combine this one and this one. And then we first combine this one and this one. And combine those two on the left here to make that a new protojet. And then it will combine this one and this one to make this new protojet. This one's too far away from anything, so nothing happens. And now I've got three protojets, but they're out too far away in angle from each other. So I can't combine them. So those are my list of jets. And then what you would do is just say, I'm only interested in jets with PT bigger than something. And if something is there, then there's one jet that I found and of any significance. So there's always in this algorithm going to be lots of jets with one GV transverse momentum, but you can just forget about those. You count, if you want to know how many jets there are, count the number of jets with transverse momentum bigger than 50 GV or something like that. Okay, so my next slide is a little review. I'm gonna start next time with a little review and we could have a, just a little bit of time for questions. I think we've got three more, two more minutes anyway. Does somebody have a question? I saw somebody with a hand up. Yes, Rock. Thanks, the camera. Uh, so my question has to do with uh, the factorization scale. We said that it comes into the PDFs via basically MS bar uh, renormalization. How does it appear in the Partana cross section? Uh, is it like a lower 
integral bound on a K, well, yeah, a lower energy bound on, I guess, if we're integrating a gluon momentum, perhaps that appear in. Yes. Oops. My picture here. Here, there's that's a good picture. So here's a picture of a calculation, and you don't calculate that blue part, you calculate the red part. However, with this simple view that MS bar renormalization uh, really uh, is approximately just putting a cutoff, then kt squared, if this is k, kt squared less than mu f squared belong to the part on distribution function. So you leave it out of the hard scattering cross-section. So you just put in a cutoff on kt in your calculation of sigma hat, uh, integrate kt down to uh, the minimum value mu f squared. That's that simple. That is, however, not exactly what you do because that's not the definition for MS bar. MS bar renormalization talks about uh, subtracting poles. So you do a calculation for the part time distribution function, uh, which is d2 minus 2 epsilon k transverse times mu to the 2 epsilon power, where that's the scale. And when you do that, with a no lower cutoff, then you'll get a pole one over epsilon and you subtract it. That's the definition of MS bar renormalization. So if you subtract out poles from the calculation of the part time distribution functions, you do the same thing in the calculation of sigma hat at lowest order, next to leading order, which is to say, if you integrate this KT in this picture of sigma hat, integrate it down to zero with dimensional regularization, you'll get a pole and you subtract the pole. And it's actually a pole times a function of Z and that function of Z is the ultra early periodicity kernel. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Okay, well, we could, I hate to do too many of these. What, is this a quick one, Andre? There, I see a hand. There's also a question in the chat. What processes do we use for fitting gluon PDFs? Uh, do you want to do that quickly or? Uh, let me address that at the beginning of the next lecture. Processes okay. for gluons, okay? I can do that. Okay. Okay, right. we'll just meet in half an hour. All right, see you in half an hour. We'll take a break, thank you. Sure. I'll stop the recording. Oh, you got it already. I'm going to stop my.